Uh, this is an article from Game, Game the Retailer here in the UK. Uh, it's an uncredited article, so whoever wrote it, I'm afraid I can't give them credit. But again, I'll put the link in the description. And uh, it is the f this is the full article, but obviously you can go check out the main article for their, their screenshots, etc. And who knows, it might have just been a website glitch. Maybe they have credited the writer after the fact. So, I'm going to read this out first, and then I'll tell you a little bit about my relationship with Tony Hawk. When it was announced that Vicarious Visions would be developing full remakes for Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2, the internet exploded. Hardcore gamers and casual players alike were thrilled that the series was coming back, and many took to social media and message boards to share their favourite memories of the original games. For many, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater was a social game. Despite it being a primarily a single player experience, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater and its sequels took inspiration from classic hard arcade games, placing emphasis on high scores, leading the game as a distinctly competitive quality. At the height of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater's popularity, it was not uncommon for players old and young to crowd around a CRT TV, passing the controller back and forth as they attempted to beat their friends' high scores. Horse. The brilliance of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater lay in its balance, if you'll excuse the pun. The gameplay was just simple enough that beginners could easily pick it up and start pulling off tricks, but complex enough that you could waste away hours trying to perfect a single level. This balance also extended to its realism. All the staple tricks were present, ollies, kickflips, manuals, etc. And all of these moves could be strung together in long and impressive combos far beyond what's possible on a real skateboard. This meant that beginners could get an authentic skating experience, while more dedicated players could string together some really creative trick sequences. It helped that Tony Hawk's Pro Skater was dripping in authenticity. Neversoft's early games absolutely nailed that early 2000s skater aesthetic, from the blaring pop-pop soundtrack to the branded clothing that many real-life pro skaters would rock. Beyond the sights and sounds, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater also evoked the culture of skateboarding from the rebellious attitude to the unapologetically silly sense of humour. As the sport of skating grew, so did Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, as an ever-expanding cast of pro skaters joined the ranks. Naturally, many fans took up skating in real life as a direct result of their affection for the Tony Hawk's games, this writer included. Again, I wish I knew your name. Although few would reach the heights of the Birdman himself, who is now the foremost famous skateboarder in the world, many would come away from the era with fond memories of roaming the streets with friends, trying and often failing to pull off their favourite tricks from Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. Could the upcoming remakes inspire a whole new generation of daring teens to take up the board? Well, that article was from uh, the 30th of July 2020, so about a month, I think, before the Tony Hawk's remakes came out. And I'll tell you what, those remakes were, like, it blew me out of the water. I was not expecting anything, like, it looked the part, but I didn't think it was going to feel the part. And sucker I am, I, I paid for it day one. I pre-ordered it, in fact. I, I don't pre-order games. In fact, the only time I condone pre-ordering is when you want to play it at midnight. And this was a rare exception where I did want to play this at midnight. Because, again, it looked beautiful, but I was like, this is too good to be true. This can't be the real deal. Vicarious Visions pulled it off. Lord knows how. They must have had some old uh, Neversoft people in there. But it felt just like the old games. Now, it didn't necessarily feel like 1 and 2 specifically, because they were from the PS1 era. But they absolutely, sort of, 3 and 4, took those core mechanics from 3 and 4, including Revert, and put it into Tony Hawk's 1 and 2. And you would not know if... If I sat you down in front of Tony Hawk 1 on the PS1... Anyway, <laughs> a little quick trip down memory lane with that one. But no, Tony Hawk's, during sort of those early millennium years, it really was a, a core staple of, of the PS2 and even going into the, the PS3 and 360 era, along with another game we'll talk about not too far ahead. But no, uh, when the writer there was talking about the, the soundtrack, the soundtrack was a key ingredient. It's really what 
seal the the spec and the feeling of gaming around the time because you know the way the skaters would promote themselves back then and even still today is with skating videos they would shoot themselves sort of like music videos and the music choice you know was really synonymous with you know their skating style so the music choice that they had to pick for the Tony Hawk's games was quintessential and if you look at interviews from bands from those early millennials, a lot of them got their first public recognition from the Tony Hawk's games. They weren't, uh, Neversoft weren't going out and uh, looking for the big bands, although there were some well-known names in there. A lot of bands were putting their songs in games for the first time back then, and a lot of them got exposure through video games, not just Tony Hawk, but anything else around those times. So... For me personally, what I recall about Tony Hawk is that the the games very quickly, due to the popularity, became almost yearly releases. One of an early example along there with the original FIFA games and things like that. And they would always come out around my birthday, uh, either a few weeks before, in which case I knew what I was getting. And uh, I think a few times it came out just after my birthday and I'd get a a gift card for a local retailer and go pick up myself when it became available. But uh, that was very much around new gaming was a hobby and not just not just something that was passing. Uh, I would even shock my, <laughs> I would even shock my mum by going downstairs later that evening on my birthday and I'd say, completed it and she'd be like, I just paid fifty pounds for that. <laughs> I'm sorry mum, completed it, it was good. But obviously Tony Hawk had a lot of replayability. Uh, the writer there also talks about the competitiveness of Tony Hawk. It was the first game I ever played online on a PS2 with the old network adapter you'd have to stick on the back there. I always thought people were cheating because when you're balancing on a rail, you know, you'll know, wobble side, side to side and you wouldn't see other players doing that. Obviously, after the fact, I know looking back, that's just the way the games were programmed. Obviously, on the other players' ends, they were actually balancing, but it looked like they had perfect balance online. Uh, so that was always a point of contention with me when I was younger. Uh, and offline multiplayer, you know, who can forget horse? I actually thought horse was something created by Tony Hawk, but I think it's something that, you know kids playing basketball or soccer and etc. Uh, I've actually been playing for a long time. Similar how we've got Kirby over here in Scotland. Uh, I won't go into that. But no, Tony Hawk, absolutely. Uh, I have to say, it did kind of reach that point of stagnation towards the end. Uh, a lot of tonal shifts as well, you know. Uh, Tony Hawk's under uh, Underground came out and it wasn't totally serious but it did have a kind of grittiness. It had the usual silly goals and stuff like that. But it had a, a genuine storyline that did border on the, uh, the unrealistic. But then Tony Hawk's Underground 2 came out, World Tour, and, uh, you know, Jackass was the age, so naturally Bam Margera's front and centre and... Yeah, that, then it got a bit silly. And then you got games like American Wasteland and stuff like that. And yeah, then we're really kind of bordering on. But then I think it changed around maybe 2004 or 5? When Skate came out from EA. Uh, skate was more of a skating simulator. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't aiming for the arcade style that Tony Hawk was. It was very much you had to... I mean, if you've played the games, you'll know, but... You use your analog sticks to replicate the way you have to flick your feet to flip the board to your ollies and your, your kick flips and what have you. Uh, so I think as Tony Hawks went into things like uh, Proving Ground, they kind of tried to be a bit more in those lines while still catering to the, uh, the arcade style. And I think that tonality is kind of what led it to its end. Not just that, but they were starting to chase trends towards the end the sales drop down they're like right how can we uh how can we reinvigorate this and you had the guitar hero games and peripheral based gaming coming in so they were like right tony hawk ray let's make a plastic skateboard and at that point you just know it was dead in the water uh, i had no intention of picking up uh ride i think i had a quick shot of it once it got traded in at my work uh, i used to work for a retailer here in the uk and uh, yeah, I felt like I was gonna break it. <laughs> Not because I was a heavy set boy and still am a heavy set boy, 
but it's uh, it's just cheaply made basically. It felt cheaply made. I'm sure a lot of time and innovation went into designing it, but I'm just saying what the end product felt like to me. But yeah, Tony Hawk, I still go back and play Tony Hawk quite frequently. It's, just, it's one of the main reasons I've still got my PS2 and my PS3 60GB. Uh, it's one of the only PS3s that were uh, backward compatible, if I recall. Uh, I'm surprised it's still taking long, to be honest with you. But no, I've got some of the, the PS2 ones and the PS1 back there. Uh, to be honest, I don't revisit the 360 PS3 era very often. Uh, American Wasteland, I think, was kind of the, the height of that part, and everything after that, Project 8, Proving Grounds, honestly, I can't remember them, to be honest. I mean, it might have been the binge mentality, because again, you know, I'd buy it and I'd have it done uh, at least a few days afterwards. Not 100% all secrets, I just mean, like, get into end progression. Uh, but yeah, Tony Hawk. Uh, I really hope that Vicarious Visions are hoping to continue their little uh, remake uh, period because I'd love to see Tony Hawk 3 and 4. In fact, better yet, and I wish they did this, I wish that the remake that they just made was purely just, they just called it Tony Hawk's Pro Scare. And almost like a live service, every six months to a year, they release a update which, or a paid expansion, what have you. Uh, where they put in another game. So if they just started it with just the Tony Hawk's 1 stuff, that would have been great. And then six months later, add in Tony Hawk 2. Six months later, Tony Hawk 3, and so on and so forth. Until you've got something similar to the Master Chief Collection, which just one game with all of the entries there. And uh, yeah, I'd pay money for that. Uh, it would just be nice just to have it all in kind of one place, you know. Kind of like what Destiny 2 is doing. They've abandoned the idea of Destiny 3 and they're just continuously updating uh, 2 to almost a detriment. I suppose we'll talk about that at a later stage. But no, Tony Hawk, absolutely hands down one of my favourite series ever. <laughs>